LGBT on college campuses today. Is there enough inclusivity yet? Or has the pendulum swung, swung in the exact opposite direction to where if you're not LGBT friendly enough or even identifying as gay yourself, that maybe you're the one who's not included or that you're feeling left out of the community? Good question. Uh, faith in athletics. How do the two fit together? Are these two diff totally different categories in our lives? Femininity in athletics. Can you be really athletic and really feminine at the same time? Wow, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, aren't we? <laughs> Thanks for being with us. So, Sam Kelly, thank you so much for being with me. It's good to be uh, here. I'm really excited to have you here. How <laughs> long did I meet you? What was it last couple year? Couple months. No, but I was talking before the first time, like a, like a year ago. Yep. And I bring, I'm sorry, I have, a, I have a slight cold. Not COVID. You're safe behind the camera. You're not safe. So it's okay. Uh, it's a, hey, the world has germs, and it's okay. Yeah, We're it's okay fine. with that. Um, yeah. And ever since I talked to you, uh, I think Rich Todd introduced us. I'm like, yep. I gotta have you on my show because your your life experiences are are they reveal a lot of what's going on in culture right now, and the ministry you're starting is really exciting. Nice. So thanks for making the trip yeah, and being here. It's great to be here. So awesome, and I love your smile. Thank you. Look at the smile. Look at the smile. This is a winning all-American, all-star <laughs> athlete smile. Um, okay, so I, I want to start where we where I started my intro, yeah. um, because I think this is a good uh, opening into your your story of being intentional about having uh, Christian athletics and 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 support for Christian Catholic athletes on campus, mm -hmm. uh, but. It's often said that the LGBT community needs, we need more welcome, more inclusivity. It's said in the secular world, it's said in the church, and usually when I hear people say that, it's a baby boomer, mm -hmm. or maybe a Gen Xer. And I think some of these folks are speaking from their paradigm that uh, they grew up in a time where, and, and, and to be totally honest, I'm like, I'm, I'm Gen X. And, uh, you know, it, <laughs> dude, if you, in my high school, if a kid had a lisp, like this person wasn't even identifying as gay, mm -hmm. they, they'd had their books knocked out of their hand. Like it was, it was common to pick on, uh, you know, to be fair, it was common to pick on everybody. Sure. Right? It was kind of a brutal time. Like if you looked any different at all. Uh, but when they talk about how, how these kids are constantly picked on, you know, I, I think they haven't talked to a Gen Z member recently mm. or a millennial because everything I hear on college campuses, like if, if you have any hesitation about gay marriage, if you question its validity, if you question um, the fact that there can be 76, I think we're up to now, genders, mm -hmm. uh, that you are completely ostracized. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that if you don't even identify as, as off the, the, you know, somewhere on the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, of LGBT or, or, or some gender fluidity, if you don't identify as yourself in certain circles, you're going to be ostracized. Mm -hmm. That might be hard for some people to accept who, who are who are boomers, but uh, tell us your story. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to actually start with a story I yeah. just heard recently because I think it draws your point out perfectly. I was recently at a conference and I was talking to some rowers who are, I won't name the school, but they're part of one of the top rowing programs in the country. Could you name the school? Can I? I don't know. Can't you name the school? I think so. Why not? Okay. If it happened, it's public news? Well, Is it I news? mean, it's, no, but... It's, if you, you, if you, you went it? and watched it, you'd see it. Can you Google it? Sure. Okay, well, if people can Google okay. it, you could say it. Okay, so Ohio State yeah. rowing, no longer known as Ohio State women's rowing because there's two girls on the team that don't identify as women. Wow. And every time they show up to a regatta, a race, they put the Ohio State flag in the ground and they put a gay pride flag in the ground. And they're forced to wear gay pride jerseys. And I was talking to a Christian athlete. and They're she, forced to wear gay pride jerseys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I talked to her about her rights, yeah. and so I'm going to hopefully work with her on some of that. But she said there's a group of us that are extremely uncomfortable, but we, we literally cannot say anything unless we will be ostracized. By the, and it's from the top down. It's the coaches all through the team. It's the entire culture and shifted this is overnight. And this is the culture of female athletics. Wow. Yeah. And that flag, by the way, I mean, there's, there's, I know there's some priests who will hang that in their church. And yeah. what, we have to be welcoming to every human being. And the catechism teaches that everybody has to be treated with respect and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, But what that flag has come to represent is far more than what the catechism says. Right. What that flag has come to represent, and probably represented from the beginning, is, is the overturning of, of that, as that athlete experienced, mm -hmm. of anyone's right to disagree, yeah, of anyone's right to to say that there are moral parameters that 
that, and those parameters are not hateful and bigoted. Yeah. Right? But mm -hmm. they've been so labeled hateful and bigoted. And obviously, because people like you are so hateful, and I can see it in your face. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're just seething with yeah. hatred. Um, so your own person, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's just a crazy gaslighting yeah, that goes on. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so what's your own experience with, with being kind of, you know, pushed on the outside in, in, in the world of athletics? Yeah, well, I played Division One soccer at UConn, University of Connecticut, and... Um, Guessing you started playing soccer when you were a little kid. Oh, yeah. yeah. Loved it. Always a dream to play D1. But when I showed up to school, you know, I had an injury, so we can talk about that later, but a third of my team was labeling themselves as, as same-sex attracted. A third. A third. A full third. A full third. And I'd say it kind of depends on the sport, but that's not way off sometimes the average on some teams. And that's and you're uh, you're in your thirties. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say that that's that's tipped to over half in some places now. My yeah. um, my little uh, my little uh, sister knows somebody in a, in a school up in up north Colorado. Yeah, it's a small uh, charter school, and this this woman just pulled her senior because there's eleven kids in the class, and and the other ten girls, uh, eleven girls, the other ten girls, all of them identify as as L G B or T mm -hmm. or, or you know like half of them are going by boy now. Um, the idea that well we're just not welcoming enough as a society to this. Like, come on. We all yeah. see what's happening. Yeah. Can we just call it what it is? Yeah. Uh, so a third of you I mean so it's it's going way past a third at this point. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see over time and, and and obviously this is not all because people were a third of people born that way. Right. I mean come on. Oh, Come and on. I deal with it all the time. Yeah. There's so many, and, and some very tragic reasons that people are struggling with that. Yeah. Um, but and for some folks, it might feel like they're born that way because it's all they ever remember. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, but this is when we these numbers are, are obviously indicative of cultural shifts. Yeah. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I, I no, talk too much. No, that's okay. Just tell no, me to shut up. Yeah, I don't know if I'll say that. All right. <laughs> Just elbow you, punch Just you, or something. Go. I don't know. Um, so about a third. Yeah, you know. and there was definitely a pressure. There was a pressure from those individuals to consider that. How did that pressure express itself? I had, and this sounds silly, but it, it just planted this little doubt. I had somebody say to me, well, have you ever like looked up to a woman, really liked a woman growing up? And I'm thinking, well, yeah. Think about all the women that I admired and looked up to. And she said, yeah. well, that means you're gay. And I was like, well, I don't think that does, but it created this like little doubt in my mind. Like, yeah. well, maybe I am, because I see it. And at that point I wasn't super formed in my faith, you know? Yeah. And, I've had a friend kind little of... Little kids told this in kindergarten now. Yeah. You can imagine the confusion. I can, I can only imagine mm -hmm. the confusion. I see it. You know, yeah. I, like, you're, like you're saying, it hap it's happening in clusters. It's happening... Yeah. Um, but yeah, it created this, this just little doubt. And, you know, my foundation and my faith, what my parents had taught me, kind of kept me, I'd say, out of that, out of experimenting. But that's not the case today. Right. It's, it's pro-experimentation. You know, the funny thing... Um, people don't, don't realize how much uh, our activity can also form our attractions. Mm -hmm. That there are more parameters that actually end up guiding your attractions. That, uh, and, and, and again, this is not the case across the board for everyone. It's not one size fits all. Yeah. And, and there are some people who they, they experience it in a way where it's like, it feels like they were just born that way, even though there's no gene right. that's been discovered attached to this. Yeah. Um, but then there's the, the growing number of people who were just out of experimentation realize, well, I can get into that. I mean, you, you yeah. frankly can get into anything right. if you lower those moral guidelines that have guided humanity for most of human history. Yeah. Um, okay, so how, did this cross a line from uh, that high percentage being just interested in you to this high, that high percentage then kind of writing you off and you feeling a little second class on your team? You know, I, I think I kind of kept my, my views silent um, for Why? a while. Why? Because what, what would, would happen if you just spoke out and said, I, I think that's oh, wrong. Oh, I would have been so ostracized. Oh, 100%. What would that ostrac uh, ostracization have looked like for you? Uh, cold shoulders, people not wanting to hang out with me, bashing me behind my back. Yeah. I mean, that already happens in too much of female yeah. sports, but... Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and that was, you know, 12, 13 years ago. I can only imagine now. Obviously, it's it could hard. have affected your position on the team. You're not going to be starting if no one likes you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in some teams, especially there's a high percentage of coaches that struggle with, with same-sex attraction, that would 100% be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
So this experience that you had in your team and that you see, by the way, I don't, I don't want to go too tangential into this. On, on a gut level, how does it strike you when guys are competing uh, who identify as girls in women's sports? Rage. Yeah, why? Rage. Uh, why? You know, you're mean and bigoted. <laughs> you're not entitled to that rage. But really, why does that strike you? It be, it because it's unfair. Yeah. It's, not, it's unfair. No matter what I do as a woman, no matter, I mean, you got to think about it. I trained for years and years and years to reach my potential as an athlete. Like, yeah. I sacrificed a lot. And for somebody to come in who hasn't had to do that yeah. and to just win, yeah. oh, that's, that's demeaning, that's enraging. Yeah. That's hard. You know what's wild? I, I, I do think it, like it, treating everybody again with respect and compassion and sensitivity, sure. respecting their emotions, right? But it seems like in society today, and this is a great expression of that, the emotions of the person who is struggling with gender identity mm -hmm. trumps everybody else's. So you feel rage, but society would look at you and say, that doesn't matter. Yeah. What you feel doesn't matter. You could work your whole life to be number one in a sport. You could be number one, in fact. Yeah. And then a, a, someone who is transgendered comes in and they're number one. Yeah. But it doesn't matter what you say. They go into my kid's bathroom. doesn't matter how my kid feels. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, I can go down that rabbit hole for a long yeah. time right now. And I gotta say this is a quick tangent, I'm sorry. Go the, for the, it. Uh, the, there, there's that, obviously that worry, if someone's mentally, emotionally unstable, that they'll hurt themselves if they're pushed over the edge. And I'm thinking of the early Christians, like no one agreed with how we saw life. Yeah. And you experienced people around you all disagreeing with you. Oh yeah. Did it lead you to suicidal ideation? <laughs> I mean, like, that's the first sign that there's something wrong here, right. that this is not just a natural expression of mm -hmm. who a person is, but there's a profound wound that has to there be dealt with. There is a deep with. wound. Uh, which, is, again, drives a, a, a response of sensitivity, but not in a way that yeah. trumps a woman athlete. And statistically, that's actually a lie. What that, is? That if you don't intervene or don't succumb to a, somebody's wishes to be transgender, that will decrease their oh, yeah, need yeah. to commit suicide. Oh, totally. That's statistically been proven. Yeah. It only increases it, actually, unfortunately. By like 19 times. Yep. Yeah. And you're not, not allowed to say that either. So we didn't say that in the show. If we're on the tube of you, right? You nope. did. That didn't happen. It's in theory, this is said, but we didn't say it. We that. didn't say it. Yeah. Um, okay, so did this, this helped. I mean, you're, you're feeling a little on the outside because of your Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. uh, helped form the foundation of, of, of Fierce Athlete. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear about that in a minute. Okay. First, I want to hear about why you're the kind of person who would have these convictions to where you have a, a, a moral compass about objective right and wrong when it comes to things like sexual ethics, things that I'm not going to experiment with or open myself up to the possibility of, mm -hmm. why you'd suffer through that, uh, why you're the kind of person that would go and start a, a, a Christian athletic association. What happened to you? Why are you so strange? I don't know. In the know. best way possible. Yeah. Uh, l long story short, I got pretty lost in college because I, coming into college, I blew up my knee. Pretty significant. Three surgeries, 13 months, they told me I'd never play again. During soccer, you blew up your knee? Yep. Mm. Yeah. So here I was set to go to, you know, to a D1 school and suddenly I was going to be sitting on the bench redshirting the first year. And wow. that led to a very, you know, an identity crisis because if you'd asked me who I was, I was an athlete. You know, I won nine state championships in high school. Like I was just, mm. that was my identity. Mm. I, I came from a strong Catholic family, but that was what made me a good person. Mm. So when Catholic the, was what made you a good person, your identity was athlete. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And, but that, that was a strong foundation for me because yeah. when the rubber hit the road and I, and I enter this college campus where, I mean, athletics is a pretty toxic culture. It's a lot of pressure. Mm. So you see people let that steam off in a lot of unhealthy ways. One being, you know, promiscuity, sexual confusion, eating disorders, partying, all these things. Mm. And so I entered this kind of crazy world and, and really tried to find which way was up, you know. And, and the Lord, again, my foundation preserved me in so many ways. I, I like praise him for the ways that, mm. that that preserved me from some of the things that could have happened. But, you know, I started to drink with my team and trying to fit in and I just was empty. Mm. I was empty. And I went to mass during preseason my junior year to escape preseason. Total whim. Really? Yeah, I was like, I need to get away from my team. It's Sunday night. Where can I go? Where all my coaches let me go? So you had not been going too massive this time. On and off. Yeah, yeah. On and off when it was convenient. So just to get away. Just to get away. And um, I was the only student there because it was early August. And uh, it was Focus's first ever day on campus, ever. Focus. Yeah. 
Fellowship of Catholic University students, in case you didn't know. There's a plug. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, and so I was the first student that they met. And, um, you know, this girl just started investing in me and loving on me and coming to my games and inviting me to a Bible study. And I was just like, you know what, I've tried everything else. Like, let's, mm. let's try this faith thing. And that winter, I got dragged basically against my will. She challenged me, which I'm an athlete, wow. so come on, you know. <laughs> challenged me to go to a conference. And it was at that conference I went to a much needed confession. But then I had a, a very radical, radical encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. Wow. Uh, during adoration, I just started to shake and cry. And I was an athlete, I didn't cry, right? Yeah, yeah. And I looked into the center of the monstrance and I just knew that was him. Mm. And I knew in that moment that I wasn't loved because I was a stud athlete or because I was still injured or mm. for anything I'd done. I was just loved as his daughter and, and loved for me. And that changed everything. Yes. Everything. Yes. Sorry, I got my teary eyed. I was just talking to, to a good friend about this who's uh, in his 50s. Like this, these are issues that throughout life, the, it's so hard to accept that unconditional love. Yeah. And just the, when the Lord just makes himself felt, and you didn't go through a lot of just counseling for it, not, nothing against counseling. No. But like all of a sudden, I'm receiving and able to receive unconditional love, and that's, that's not a piece of bread, dude. No. That's incredible. Yeah. And as an athlete, I'm all in. And so it's like, yeah. this is true, this is real. Yeah. My whole life has to change, and everybody has to know it. And just the Lord just delights in you for you. You don't have to do mm -hmm. a dang thing. Yeah. I mean, we do things because he loves us, but not so that he'll love us. And there's a yeah. huge difference between those two things yeah. that uh, we often remember. Yeah. So yeah. all of why, well, you know, why do I believe in a moral code and why do I, everything, that's just all the details that follows mm -hmm. an encounter with him. You know what else is great, though? It was also some of the details that preceded your encounter, that you weren't so morally blind by the time you sat there because... Yeah. Even if you weren't devout, you were missing masses on Sunday, you, you held on to what your mom and dad gave you yeah. in a way that made faith possible. Yeah. And I'd like to encourage any parents watching this that, and yeah. I say this to them all the time, that the foundation that you lay for your children, it's there. It's in the back of their minds. They pretend it's not. They pretend it's not, but you, you it have, saved me. You have one tattoo. What does it say on the tattoo? I love you with all the madness in my soul. <laughs> yeah. I love you with all the madness in my soul. She was telling this before, before we filmed. And uh, isn't that that's a Bruce Springsteen lyric? It is quote. a Springsteen lyric. Yeah. The boss. The boss. I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> no way. Yeah, yeah. So he's my neighbor, kind yeah, of. I've been that's to a like small state. seven concerts. It's great. Have you really? Yeah. He's a little off the deep end right now as okay. we're talking about concert, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, he knows what uh, it is to ache. Yeah, yeah. Searching. Music brings you in touch with that. But I love that, that quote, and it, it, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes I read recently from uh, Deus Caritas as God is love. God's eros for yeah. man is also totally agape, so Pope Benedict XVI. I, the madness of my soul, like yeah. the eros of God, like the passionate lover kind of love. Boy, that's crazy. And he continues, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart recoils within me. He's, he's quoting Hosea, where a man felt called to marry a prostitute and be faithful to her. And then Benedict says, God's passionate love for his people, for humanity, is at the same time a forgiving love. It's so great that it turns God against himself, his love against his justice. <laughs> passionate love for me. Why? It's just because I'm his. Yeah. It's like I love my kids just because they're mine. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so how did that, how did that uh, play out? How did that change things for you? How did things look different in sports? You didn't just stop playing sports. No. No, I went back with freedom. <laughs> yeah, Because yeah. if I knew, but I didn't, I mean, it, it, was a, it, you know, it was a learning process, but I didn't really care what my coach thought anymore or my teammates. I just got to play and for the Lord. you were able to play with your busted knee. Yeah, the Lord kind of healed that, so that was good. Did he? Yeah, well, I had to have another surgery, but they found out that it was still messed up so they fixed it and all of a sudden I could play. Praise God. Yeah. So he worked in that. Yeah, I know went on to, you know, start and become a captain. Wow. But but really what I'm proudest of is the Lord revealed to me because I was thinking about not taking my fifth year at one point. Mm. Because I redshirted and in athletics you get an extra year. Uh, so I didn't play my freshman year essentially. Mm. And I was gonna leave. And the Lord was like, if you leave who's gonna reach your team? Wow. I put you on this team for a reason. And that was before I was really getting playing time and I was like, okay. So my team became my mission. And Boy, my goal, that's awesome. My goal was just love them. And some of them that was, you know, who were struggling with things we talked about, that was just like, hey, can I pick you up at 2 a.m.? For others, it became, you know, 12 girls that joined me in Bible study and that prayed with me before games. Wow. We built that culture 
you know, and, and, and to come back, we had one girl my senior year, my fifth year struggling with same-sex attraction, one. Because we created a culture of authentic, unconditional love, not one of preying upon and experimentation, but one rooted in truth and love. Even if I wasn't wow. necessarily proclaiming that all the yeah. time. That gave me chills. Yeah. That was good. That was all the Lord. That a pure love context where, where you can look at another person and like the Lord looks at you and say, you're just so beautiful. Yeah. And have it not be like, I want to do something with you yeah. now, therefore. Right. Uh, what a lot of freedom that is. I, I, you just reminded me of St. Pierre Giorgio Fursati. I'm putting you on a pedestal. Uh, where he, he said he wanted to be a, an engineer so he can go minister to people who are in the mines. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people get this wrong idea that ministry is like I'm going to go into ministry like Chris Stefanik is or like my priest is mm-hmm. uh, or in some apostolic work. But it can take so many forms. Yeah. Just like being a Christian right where you are without compromise but with a lot of love at the same time in a world that wants to say you're hateful and bigoted. Like, mm-hmm. no, I'm here and I really love you. You know, no matter how you I- I- are identifying to me, I'm loving you because that's who I am in Jesus. Yeah. Good on you, man. That's incredible. Thanks. Okay, tell me about Fierce. Because this is all this is all become now over time. Yeah. Uh, a beautiful national or international? International. Intergalactic. Intergalactic. This is there's only this is only only the only uh, we started here galactically, but yeah. there's many galaxies. There's trillions of people involved. <laughs> so your international ministry, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. What is it? Uh, how do we get it? How do we sure. hear more about the story? Tell us about this. Yeah. So our mission is to promote true identity, which we kind of talked about that daughterhood, yeah. and femininity. Uh, in, sports. in female sports, based on the teachings of the church. Is it a specifically Christian or Catholic ministry or a ministry guided by Christian principles that's for, for anybody? Yeah, so it, it is Catholic in, in its roots, so fierce is an acronym, big words. I won't, don't have to go through them, but the C is Catholicism. But no, that, no, dude, let's, what are all the words? Do it. Okay, okay. It's our, kind of our formation. So F is femininity. What does it mean to be a woman in sport? What does it mean to be a woman in sport? A lot of people think of like femininity, sports, uh, the sports are inherently manly. Yeah, you know, a lot of even devout people have this completely wrong idea about what femininity mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, what well, is it? Well, it's so interesting. We're made in God's image and likeness, not so much in our singularity, but in our communion of persons. Mm. So, I always ask the question: Well, why did God create two sexes? <clears throat> what does that reveal? Mm. It's a mirror of Him. It's a mirror of His Trinitarian love. So, the sexual difference actually reveals the difference between masculinity and femininity. So my body reveals that the height of my femininity is my receptivity and my ability to bear forth life. The height of masculinity is sacrifice. Mm. So I use the context of basketball. Self-gift. Yeah. So if you watch basketball, how men play it and how women play it, it's actually different. Is it? Yeah. How? Men drive into the hoop a little bit more, more dunking, more physical. Women, they say it's a prettier game. There's more passing involved, which wow. reveals something naturally different that's about awesome. the woman's receptivity. Yeah, that's great. So I, what I realized is, you know, I always felt unfeminine because I'm six feet tall and muscular and love sports. But the fact that I was created a woman makes me feminine in my whole being. Wow. Every time I play my sport, I'm receptive to my teammates. I'm receptive to pain. I'm receptive to suffering. I'm offering that as a prayer. I'm actually living out my femininity in my yeah. own particular way. That's awesome. As a fierce BA athlete. <laughs> but I don't divorce that from my natural tender side. It's like this, this coupling of this fierceness. Like Our Lady was fierce. She's like crushes head of Satan. But she's also the most tender woman that ever lived. That's what it is to be a fierce athlete. I am so glad I stopped you with the F. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That's basically everything. <laughs> that's so you don't so, have to keep going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't top that one. Yeah, no, that's, that's it all. Wow. Yeah. To, to express all that is feminine in, in athletic passion yeah. and athleticism and, and even physical strength, uh, but expressed in a different way. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Because just like the, the world has these stereotypes, the, 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 within the church you find these too, yeah. that women have to fit a certain particular mold. You know, and some yeah. guys who are very devout are almost scared yeah. off by people who are like powerful women in their mm-hmm. own way. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, yeah. just to own that. I think of Our Lady too. Yeah. Yeah. My soul magnifies the Lord. She wasn't kidding around, man. No. I was a strong woman. Yeah. Real she played basketball, woman. I think, and uh... <laughs> she probably did. <laughs> okay, so that's the F. I won't yeah. make you spend as much time on each letter. It's but okay. Run I the is letters. identity. We start with identity. Yeah. E is embodiment. We talk about the beauty of the female body. Awesome. R is receptivity. The okay. body reveals receptivity. C is Catholicism, and E is encounter. So. I didn't name it, you know, Catholic female athletes because I didn't want it to explicitly yeah. be 
um, something that would deter people. But I love the logo too. Really thank cool. you. It's based off the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. Oh, and the FA, Fierce Athlete. Yeah, well there you done, go. Well done, logo artist. Wow, board member. And the, and the, and the cool flame. The blue cool flame. Blue flame. It's yeah. incredible. Uh, so how do people find out about it? Fierce.org. Fierce.org. And you have stuff for athletes and for coaches. Yeah, we just started a new branch, Fierce Coach. Okay. So that started, I mean, J January 1st. So it's new. I got somebody else who was a former D1 coach running that. And what do you provide for the Fierce Coaches and for the Fierce Athletes? What's it look like when, when people do a Fierce thing in there? Yeah, so we have, and they want I, to do the fierce. Yeah, yeah. Why does she start? We have a podcast. Okay. Um, but then I travel to different high schools, colleges, hosting. I have a certification in strength and conditioning, so we kind of do a hybrid, basically a theology of the body retreat with a strength and conditioning clinic. So okay. we're being active together, and I'm teaching different principles, and then there's talks and things. I lead retreats, speak. Um, do people have fierce groups and stuff that they start? We're getting there. Okay, good. That's we're, we're at the ground floor here. Yeah, we're doing some cool, like, elite camps this summer for college athletes. Oh, that's we got great. Some, and then we're going to do a coaches summit as well. So we got That's awesome. A lot of stuff. Summit. Okay, so we, this is uh, this is a beautiful brand that spreads a, an an idea and a movement. Just yeah. and this is a good way to do it. Don't don't make it too clunky. No. You know, you, you embody the that movement and uh, spread the t-shirt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the logo, the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. What is the podcast called? Fierce Athlete Podcast. Okay. I'm downloading that right now. And um, your book, you have a book coming out soon. I do. It's called Be Fierce, The Athlete's Guide to Growing Physically, Mentally, and Spiritually. Beautiful. Yeah. So it's a little 100-page book for, for athletes. And I wrote it in a way that's very practical. So athletes love to practice things. Yeah. So it kind of walks through, um, yeah, how to grow in all those areas, uh, but gives some, hey, try this. Mm. Um, hey, sh do this with your team. Um, some very practical items that, that they could be doing to grow. In. How do people get it? Um, check out fierce.org, but then it'll also okay. be on Amazon. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, let's come full circle here. Right. Uh, athletics to Christianity to athletics. And then how, how do you, I mean, being a Christian has made you a better athlete. Yeah. Because you're, when your identity is not tied to something, you can give it your all. Yeah. Because you got nothing to lose. Nothing. Right? You actually have fun doing it. You don't burn yourself out. Yeah. Uh, but being a good athlete can make you a better Christian too, right? I, I think of the... Uh, I love the image of the burning bush. Mm. It, it, the, the fire doesn't consume the bush. And this is like this is the life of God in us. That fire, it doesn't doesn't require that, that the thing it's ignited goes away yeah. and get get eaten by it. Uh, but it's perfected. And it's yeah. purified. It's more more beautiful. Um, so the the thing that is sports when uh, you, you do it better as a Christian, but then it also makes you a better Christian. What aspects of, of athleticism? make you better at doing the Catholic thing. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. Make first, the fire grow. Well, first, and, and this is a little bit of a bone I have to pick with the Catholic world, so since yeah. we're just going pick there the today. Pick the bone, pick the bone. We are body and soul. And what we do to our souls affects our bodies, what we do to our bodies affects our souls. Yeah. And we gotta be taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Because that's not gonna affect your prayer life. If you're feeling well, it's gonna affect your prayer life. So, so glad that's, you said it. that's the first. The second. So it's not just theology of the body in relation to intimacy between man and woman, which people talk about all the time. It's like, no, there's a whole lot of overlap here. Yep. Yeah, yep. in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. How, now, how does it affect your soul? Like, how does, it, how does working out affect your prayer life? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, if I'm working out, then I'm, I have a lot, I'm able to focus a lot better in prayer. Hey, you focus. Gosh, You're so there. much more. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, what's the question? Uh, how does it make you a better Christian? Oh, Athleticism. yeah. <laughs> my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, sorry, we got off the page. One good. of my favorite quotes is um, JP2. He says, sport is a gymnasium of human virtue. Mm. I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to persevere. I know what it is to overcome obstacles. I know what it is to work with people that are different than me. I know what it is to have patience. All from athletics. I know what it is to lead. Mm. It's a good place to practice being human. Yeah. Way to human. Yeah, way to and way to, way to, I just verbicided that. That worked. Way, <laughs> way, and way to train others to be truly human. Thank you. Yeah, so which it's is an honor. Which is really rooted in, in just receiving that unearned love and then giving it back to everybody, everybody, everybody. Yeah. And I love, you hear the John Paul II quote when he was criticized for skiing? No. You know? No. When he was a cardinal, yeah. uh, so, someone saw him skiing and they're like, isn't it unbecoming for a cardinal to go skiing? And he said, no, it's unbecoming for a cardinal to ski poorly. Agreed. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you're going to be a cardinal, ski, ski well. Ski well. I, I, I love you. And I'm proud of you. And Thanks. I'm just grateful that you came me. on. Thanks for Appreciate being awesome it. and for all that you do. Oh, thank yeah. you. My friends, I love you. Thanks for being with us.
Stay strong in the faith. It's, it's, uh, it's what makes life beautiful. It's what makes you beautiful. And keep loving on and serving everybody just as you are, right wherever you are, wherever God has called you, whether your passion sports, whether it's being an engineer like Fursati, God's going to use you right in that context to, to remind others of who they really are in Christ, which can't be reduced to their performance, which can't be reduced to, to sexual relationships, but as a beloved son or daughter of God, which in that identity, we, guys, it's, it's, it, instead of just talking about why the world is wrong, I got to tell you, this is so much better. This identity is like so infinitely better than any identity the world could try to get people to embrace. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thanks Thank for reminding you, us. Yeah. See you next time. Man, wasn't that great? Listen, if you don't want to be happy, be sure not to subscribe. But if you want a more joyful life, the kind of life that God created you for, the kind of life Jesus promised when he said, I came to give you life to the full, then make sure you hit subscribe and share this channel with everybody you know.